Welcome, everyone. Um, so uh, we've had, uh, for the Earth, Space, and Environmental Science interest group, we've had sessions for, um, as ever since we were instantiated, pretty much at every single plenary. And we're here again. Um, we have some really exciting topics to bring to you today. So uh, Leslie Wyborn, who's currently in Australia, and one of our co-chairs will be kicking us off. Uh, and I want to thank the other co-chairs of the interest group. So Danny Kincaid, who I'm sure will be here any moment, uh, Helen Glaves, who is actually at the, I believe, the EGU programming uh, meeting in, I'm not sure where they're holding it, but I, I for all of you who go to EGU, uh, wish them good luck because we were excited about their program coming up for next year. Uh, Pedro Carrera is here from uh, Brazil. Pedro, I just saw you. There you are. Okay. Um, and of course, Leslie's in uh, Australia. So uh, my, I, it's very nice to see all of our, our co-chairs uh, and work with them. Uh, if you're not a member of the interest group, uh, please do take a moment to hop over onto the RDA website and join our mailing list so that you can get uh, updates going forward because we're going to have some really exciting stuff going on. Leslie, why don't I hand it to you? Could you advance? Um, okay. Can you hear me in the audience now? Oh, yes. We can hear you just great. Okay. All right. So first slide, please. Okay. So the Earth, the ESIP RDA, Earth Space Environmental Science Group, works towards coordinating and harmonizing multiple international efforts, both in interdisciplinary and domain-specific FAIR data infrastructure development, vocabularies, and common digital data services. Through so open communication and chat, we're just trying to reduce possible du duplication, increase efficiency, share use cases, um, share whinges, share pitfalls that we've uh, got into, and above all, promote partnerships and adoption in the global community. We're about sharing information on projects and highlighting who is doing what, where, again, to emphasize, we're trying to avoid unnecessary duplication. Next slide, please. So this meeting, what we want to do is um, keep continuing mapping the infrastructures and vocabulary resources and invite you to further refine our catalogs we're going to show some recent achievements and highlight new projects. And um, then for our deep dive, we're going to focus on the status of Earth-based environmental science domain data repositories globally. Uh, which ones comply with fair care and trust? Which ones do we need? So we just want to have open discussion. Next slide, please. So we've, as Shelley said, we've been active at every um, plenary since P10 in Montreal in 2010 when we started. And as I said, we run these two catalogs, infrastructure catalog, semantic resources. We always welcome new members, particularly from the global south. And in particular, we really want to hear what's going on in the global south. And so we're bottom up, we just, want to have this as a meeting place to share our activities and stop reinventing the wheel. Next. So this is our agenda. I've just burbled on for five minutes. Then we're going to um, look at, just have a brief introduction to the catalogue because it's a bit hard to show them to you online here. And then we're going to do lightning presentations on a few um, results from projects and new proposals. And then we'd like to introduce an exciting GeoInquire project from one of the European Horizon stalls. And as I said, we'll then do our group discussion. Next. So the meeting notes, they're linked in the page for this thing. Please put your name, your affiliations, your country, and any infrastructures you are associated with. And uh, as Shelley said, there's the group page and please sign up. Next slide, please. Okay, so unfortunately, as I said, I can't um, link or we can't link to them um, in this plenary, but there is an infrastructure catalog. Uh, please go in there, explore it. And if you know a project or you have a project, 
is not on that list, please add it. And then above all, we're also after any vocabularies, ontologies or semantic resources that you're developing. Um, these are actually starting to be cited in some literature publications. So um, please uh, do them. Now, Maggie's just asked if these are the notes. Hang on in the chat. Yes, they're the notes, Maggie. So if you're online, they're the notes. And we invite you to post project news on our website. Nicely. Now I'll hand over to either Shelley or Christina to um, run the lightning talks. So over to you, Shelley or Christina. Lastly, before, before we go off this page, um, when's the last time we had anybody add an item to the data infrastructure catalog? They added quite a few at the last one because of like data spaces, uh, Geo Inquire, the Destination Earth, all those new European projects that came off. And I should be adding the Envry Hub next, which has just been announced. Okay. Does anybody so know certainly... the So the reason this is going to matter is when we get to a discussion on the Earth, uh, Earth and Environmental Community of Practice, these connections with these organizations are going to be like a a roadmap for us to uh, reach out to you and 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 figure out what what the relationships should all be, and we don't want to miss anybody. So um, just somebody, um, somebody needs. Okay, to... Shelley, if you go yeah. into everyone, if you go into the notes, which are you know linked to the um program, mm -hmm. this, uh, okay. yeah, yeah. I've actually put the link to these slides in that as well. So Perfect. you should be able to get the link to the slides. And we, we can also run around with the link for you and like personal emails can happen, whatever you need. We just want to make sure we're updated because we want to, we're, we're about to add gas to the car uh, engine. Um, I've just put Red the link car. to the um, slides in the chat for those of you that are in the zoom link and from okay. that you, you can get into the catalogs okay and isn't our um our working document in our rda session description isn't it there yeah it's in the rda session description as well okay, there you go that might be the fastest way for you to get it okay cool if if you're like halfway through this meeting come like wave your hands and i'll know why you're waving or i'll assign you to a task whichever feels right at the time um and we'll um uh, we'll make sure you get the link. So we really want your new projects identified. Okay, Leslie. So you want me to move forward, right? Yes. And Christina's and right come. here in case I fall over. All right. So we're going to start our lightning talks. Could we go on to the next slide, please? And our first speaker is Pedro Carrera. He ha he and I have partnered together on, on a really awesome project. Uh, he brought uh, his team and his students from the University of Sao Paulo to work on things about open science. And uh, he, we, since these lightning talks are so quick, I'm just going to leave it right there. Come on over, Pedro. Yay, Pedro. Thank you. <laughs> Hi, everyone. Uh, okay. I can. Just say next time. Next yeah. time. Okay. It's okay. Uh, I have a short presentation here about the multi-language uh, support in the project related with open science. And uh, there is some um, tools that was developed in, in the uh, Parsec project. It, are you talking about a little bit about the Parsec project here? Next slide, please. Not working. Uh, Parsec project is a chronimus Chronimus for building new tools for data sharing and reuse through a transnational investigation of the socioeconomic impacts of protect area. Okay. And uh, this is a Belmont Forum project. This Belmont Project Forum is supported by national uh, research agents in Brazil, France, Japan, and uh, with participation of other countries like uh, Australia and Leslie is part of this project here. With uh, some organization like CISAB is uh, the organization that uh, the, the responsible for this project in French. Okay. 
No. Not yet. No. Good. Perfect. So uh, just talking about uh, these, um, um, what we have done, the, this is a, uh, a Parsec initiative uh, with leadership of Shirley Stahl here. And um, it was developing a checklist and the guidelines for researchers introduced in open science in five languages. This is the, here, this is the all five languages, all resources here. You can find this uh, this link, all of information available in the AGU um, AGU site uh, re related with this. What we have done here related with this. So, next slide, please. Uh, in this um, in this journey, we have steps um, for open science. This is the English version. We have. Uh, similar in, in different languages for in fi more for for um, languages uh, the first the first step is related with uh, how you can do your um, digital presence this is mostly related with orc id how you create your orc id and the, uh, your, your id as a researcher the second is related with how you document your data set that you created data set and the, uh, when you publish your data during the, uh, the, the this, this scientific the synthetic experiment you publish your data set uh, the the uh, third one is related with how you can make your software citation uh, using DOI how you can publish your software citation this is the link that you created with uh, uh, recommendations how you can do you uh, not just publish but how you can do how you can make best documentation of your software there is the, some discussion about this and fourth is related with uh, how you can improve the transparency uh, in the team because when you open science project there is more um, more different uh, uh, the people from different multidisciplinary multidisciplinary project. There is a multinationality project, so it's important to make this transparency between the team. This is discussion about the this four. The fifth one is oh, sorry, is related with uh, uh, how you can create uh, resources for and tools that could be used for the teams. How you can use tools for sharing, for communication, and how you can use tools for deploy uh, this kind of. Uh, this is just towards related with this. How you can improve the uh, the communication and the uh, tools for improve the transparency in the team. And the last one is related with uh, uh, how you can. Uh, uh, a list of um, uh, digital objects that we can create in checklist for teams. So this is six uh, six step that you can uh, use for journey. It's a, like a shell because you start as a research, as a team, and this is like a shell. This is the we use the the this figure here to represent this journey. So thank you very much. This is my presentation about this. Thank you. Thank you, Shile. Um, next slide. Uh, I, I'm really delighted. Um, if you have any questions, the, the materials are meant to be connected directly to researchers. So uh, we've tested it out with our research team of, of 40. And um, and you, you're introducing me. Oh 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 oh! You brought the you brought the oh fantastic! So so we have these really great postcards, and uh, Professor Pedro brought the ones that were done for our meeting in Brazil. 
Um, so on the back, it's English, Spanish, and Portuguese, but it you can easily navigate to Japanese and French from there. Um, and I did have somebody uh, uh, a volunteer to help us with German, by the way. Um, so in case you're feeling like you're left out for German speakers here. Um, so just don't worry, you're not left out. Um, yeah, thank you. So um, do you wanna do you wanna hand them out? Yeah. Here. Okay. Um, next slide. So our next topic is uh, about uh, a, a new type of group that RDA has. Uh, I'm not sure if you heard Hillary talk about this before, but the, um, it was introduced, uh, the new, uh, called community of practice. It's important to know how RDA is defining a community of practice. So it's essentially meant to be more of an umbrella organization for a particular discipline across the working groups that already exist, across the interest groups, not taking that work over, but helping to connect recommendations coming from RDA to your particular discipline. Um, and there's uh, uh, some of you have participated in, <clears throat> in discipline specific efforts and uh, some of the work that's happening um, uh, in, in, in the communities uh, that AGU is working in, uh, that ESIP's working in, that um, uh, the SE group for EGU, that the Open Science group for JPGU um, is working in, is requiring more of an international uh, uh, collaboration, more awareness, more connection across the world. So gosh, that seems like a community of practice at RDA. So we're going to give it a go. Um, we Next slide, please. We had an interest group. So there's four slides, the same QR code is on all slides. Your um, your opportunity is four slides to get the QR code. So um, we held an interest meeting in February. If you weren't there, don't worry, you're here. Um, and we were collecting comments about what people thought a community of practice could do. Um, we will send this link out on this IG's email list, uh, but it's really good to have you have access right now because I, I do want you to weigh in this week um, and you're welcome to share this with anyone. This is not closed. This is open. Um, you know, please have your communities weigh in, think about it. Um, this is meant to be valuable to you because if you're here, then you care about the interest group. And if you care about the interest group, you'll care about the community of practice. So uh, there was a very, if you were in the meeting, what was said out loud is a one hour meeting held in two different time zones. Maybe I picked, I don't know, maybe it was after holiday for some country. There wasn't a lot of chit chat on the hour meeting. But in the writing, in the in the form that we gave, people were like, oh yeah, this is brilliant, you have to do it. Um, so I just want you to know, uh, for those, if you were there in the room, you want me to give another go? I don't believe you. I just want you to know right now. Okay, you're right. Um, okay, everybody, thing works now. Um, so uh, if you were there in the meeting, it was kind of lukewarm, but if you read what people wrote, it was like, oh yeah, this is great. Clearly they had coffee halfway through the meeting. So, okay. Um, so our next steps are, well, what is it going to be? So, so this doesn't guarantee we're going to stand it up because if you all go, oh no, this is terrible and there's no support, then it dies. But I don't think that's going to happen. I think you're going to say, this is cool. Uh, I'm going to try the thing again. Ah, look, it worked. So there's in the QR code, you're going to go to a Google doc try not to have opinions on the Google doc, right? Like it's, it was last night, 3 a.m. Don't, don't, don't judge me. Um, there's three areas I want you to go to area. And it's the blue, the blue, look for the blue. Number one, what scope? So in the interest meeting, we proposed it as earth space and environmental sciences. There was concern that that was too much. So please weigh in. The way I want you to weigh in is put your name next to whichever scope you think matters. And if fr frankly, if you don't agree with either of these scopes, well, first of all, if, if this isn't your thing, just skip it. Like if, you know, if you're in and you, and you care about this, then answer. If you're like, oh no, somebody else in my organization, send it over to them, send it over to them. Um, 
So if you think there's a third answer or a fourth answer, add it. You should be able to edit that Google Doc. If you can't, I need to know right away because then Christina is going to go in and fix it. Um, but there was a there was a specific discussion at the interest meeting. Space should not be here, and it was it was by more than one person. So help us out. I don't care what the answer is because this is you, right? Like whatever the answer for the group is is the answer. So weigh in. Okay. Next slide. Uh, never mind. I've got that. Okay. Item number two. What should the community of practice do? Okay, so what you can't see here, but I'm going to describe to you, is there's two sections for this. The top section is general things RDA thinks a community of practice should do for their discipline. So a lot of those are really good. Um, so they're listed at the top. Put your name on the lines that you say, oh yeah, this should be part of the community of practice. Go nuts. I don't care if all of the lines are filled because if you think they're all valuable, then they shall all be included. It doesn't mean we deal with them all or the chairs. So I don't know who the chairs will be. It doesn't mean the chairs deal with them all in the first 18 months. It means it matters to you all, okay? So there's two sections. Um, so something that's really important a community of practice does not take over the work of an existing working group unless they want it to, but we're not asking that. We're communicating, you're collaborating, we're connecting to the existing working groups, the existing recommendations to help inform our discipline. So I, if, if somebody sees like, for instance, I'll pick ontology because there's a lot of passion in ontology. You're going to see ontology on a row. That doesn't mean we're going to say to the ontology people, it's ours now. Like, no, <laughs> that is not what this means. It means the ontologies around the earth and space sciences matter to us. We would communicate with the ontology folks and say, okay, how do we connect this information to our researchers, right? That's what this is. All right. I just want you to know, because it, it's a different kind of working group. Or it's a different kind of group at RDA. And then the second part is the items. I pulled the items out um, of the, uh, the meeting in February. And then you can add more. Like if you see something like, oh my God, I can't believe they totally missed this. You know, oh, this is so important. Added it. And then put your name there. This, I care about this, right? Um, you know what that means though, that it gets upvoted. And if you care, you might help with it. Maybe you'll volunteer. I mean, you know, this goes on to like actually do the work, right? Okay. Next one. I feel like I hit five minutes and I'm blown right by it. Um, third one, what are we actually going to do? And this is this is meant to be our initial projects as a new community of practice. Community of practice go on um, until the community decides they're not needed. So they're, they persist. Um, so this is the first, think about it as a uh, an 18-month window. It's different than a working group. It, it might be determining what working groups should be stood up. That could be what our first set of outcomes are. What are the most important things that we set in objectives? And therefore we should figure out, we need a working group for this, or we need to pull two working groups together and have a synthesis conversation, whatever. So, so the, the framework is you're, you all have projects, right? You're funded, you have your institutions, you have an affiliation. But some things are challenging because you need other pieces of the puzzle. And this is where we think we can help there. We can bring the, the members here would be from, I'm going to use the word stakeholder, but I realize some communities, that's an offensive word, rights holders, stakeholders. Um, uh, so bro think broadly about that word. Um, and I don't mean to offend anyone. And I apologize if I did. I'm sorry. Uh, help me with the right word then. Um, uh, but we're, it's meant to be broad, uh, uh, different groups of people that are interested in the earth and space sciences, institutional leadership, things like that. Um, okay. And then we would help get endorsement for recommendations. So um, umbrella. Okay, that's it. That's what I have to tell you. Um, and then based on what you say this week, in, um, we'll send out an email to the full IG. We'll take a look at that. Um, if we're able to come up with the top three or four, we'll just move ahead with this document. And you'll see there's a lot of blank spaces. So please, Shelly, this is blank. Why is it blank? Because it was 3 a.m. Um, so we'll, we'll start to fill it out and then we'll send it back out to you for review. And you can send it out to your communities and we'll 
be as best we can to be inclusive. And then the chairs need to come from multiple con continents. Um, so if you're interested, say something. <laughs> um, I don't know who the chairs are. We don't, there's no, we haven't had a conversation about who the chair should be. So it could be anybody. If you have an interest and you want to be part of this, you see this valuable and you want to be a chair, now's your chance. Yes. Um, okay. I think that's it. Here, so I, I put up a very bare bones, skeleton, little content to no content site on RDA. What it does have is the group email, which means you can join it. And by joining it, it means we will continue to send you the updates until we get to the point of a complete document, we submit it for the review process. Questions? So I see two, so Kirsten, Kirsten. Oh yes, please do use the microphone. We are recording this and there's people um, online. Here's Dega from Potsdam, Germany. I would like to understand more the difference between uh, an interest group, which we are running for several years now, and this community of practice. What would be the benefit mm -hmm. of developing or creating one? I, I think you, you said that it's much more on the disciplinary, but the ESIS interest group is already disciplinary. Yeah. Maybe it's, it helps if we understand a little more about what it means. Um, so you're not the only one who's asked that question. Um, and there, and even, even Leslie Wyborn brought up, well, if we stand up a community practice, do we still need an interest group? That's actually a good question. Um, it wasn't assumed that we would close the interest group down, uh, but I did note that the agriculture community of practice did pull their interest group in, close down the interest group in order to conserve on energy so that they would be managing just one group. Um, uh, I do see this community of practice needing a community manager. I see it needing a funded position, a like part-time position to help with this work. And if I, it, it, I'm trying to imagine playing, you know, pitching that to a funder and a community of practice might be able to get money easier than an interest group um, because we would have a particular um, set of objectives. Uh, the interest group has a particular set of objectives. We could stay with just the interest group. That is also a possibility. So I don't know the answer. Um, if you come up with objectives that are in this list and the interest group co-chairs look at it and say, I don't think the interest group could host that, then I think that will answer the question and that we would send that information back out. We think the community of practice is the right way to go. And if you want to weigh in on that, we'd love to have more people weighing in on that. Does that help? Did I do? Yeah, you're not convinced. Okay. No, no, actually at RDA, yeah. So Kirsten just said everyone's doing communities of practice. So I would, I would, I think I would, I would counter argue that actually RDA is wondering why there's not more communities of practice. So we are almost like a, a test case. So the agriculture folks were the obvious answer. They had multiple working groups, They and we do too, we have multiple working groups. Um, and they were trying to do a larger thing, um, bring in, um, I think they have commercial partners. Um, they, they were connecting multiple organizations outside of RDA. Uh, into this umbrella group. And I see that, right? Like we have OGC, we have GEO, we have other, other organizations that don't connect into RDA well. There's an opportunity to include them. By the way, if you think that objective is a good one, I see somebody nodding their head, please write that down. Um, there's, there's an opportunity to do this umbrella concept and it can be a light touch, right? Like it can be, we're not gonna tell you what to do, but if we if we intentionally work together Maybe there's something good about that. Um, I don't know the answer to it, but you all do. You're working in those groups and I have a sense for it, but you're the ones who will say, yeah, that's gonna matter to me. Um, if you write, no, it's not gonna matter to me, then you know what, this was fun, <laughs> move on. <laughs> um, th there was another comment, yeah. <clears throat> Sorry if I'm being a little bit slow, I'm, I'm uh, trying to keep up. Um, so, 
I, I found the page. I signed in as a member now for the ES. ES. How'd it go? And, Was it okay? Um, am I being now automatically informed on the uh, community of practice, or is that an extra thing I need to sign up on? Are Are you a member of the IG? Uh, now I am. Good. Are you a member of the community of practice? No, not yet. Okay. You'll definitely get all the information on the IG. Okay. Um, this was just a way for, so instead of saying, Hey, everybody in the notes, write your name down and tell me if you're interested in the community of practice. Instead, I'm saying, Hey, if you're interested in the community of practice as well, go ahead and sign up. You will get all the information because the IG, the community of practice isn't a thing yet. Okay. It's noted as not endorsed. It, uh, it's it's in the sheet there with the scope, we're supposed to put our name down in which option we prefer. Yeah, that'll help me understand where the majority of folks are going. Like if you all say we must have space, meaning planets and not geospatial, but planets, that's what space means. Um, we need to have the planets part of this or, you know, things beyond our Earth atmosphere. Um, yes. Great. So. The folks that were concerned about space being a part of it, we can have a conversation and scope what they're concerned about and make sure we resolve that. Um, like that. Thanks. Yes. It doesn't mean I'm going to assign you, but I will ask. <laughs> um, just, right. Okay. Any? Yes. Mark Parsons coming up to the microphone. Um, yeah, Mark Parsons, United States. Um, I was basically ask Kirsten's question, but then hearing your hearing your answer, I can see value in a community of practice, but then we should get rid of the interest group and we should minimize the overhead in creating a community of practice and basically just make the interest group a community of practice, which broadens its scope as I think, like you say, a more sellable sort of label and not spend too much time on the administrative work of doing this. Okay. I think the co-chairs of the IG would appreciate it in the notes because that will validate for us that the community, one member of the community would really like that. And if he puts it in the notes and you all plus one it, then you've just weighed in and we're done. And we'll... John would always say, just get on with John? 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 First co-chair of RDA Council. Is that like a trivia game? Um, okay. Any other questions? Leslie, I know you're killing me because um, I can't see you, but I know I'm going over five minutes. Okay. Now our next talk. And I'm back. Uh, Danny Kincaid. Uh, so, excuse me, thanks. please, but I've been raising oh, my Maggie. hand for Hi, quite Maggie. some awesome. time. Hi, Hi, guys. Yeah, so I just have this very uh, quick question. Why are you requiring people to put names in this uh, voting list? I, I think that might be, uh, there, there might be people who are very uh, hesitant about them being volunteered maybe by accident later. So why not just put an X or something? Okay. Um, how do I feel about that? Um, I, mm, you okay? If if anyone's having any trouble, um, not trouble. If anyone would prefer to stay anonymous, you are welcome to send me an email with your thoughts, and I will keep what you're saying anonymous. And that is perfectly welcome and okay. The reason I'd like to know who you are is because you represent you and your organizations, and that like if if you're if you're writing in from NASA and you say this matters to me. I'm going to be like, Ooh, NASA has money. Let's see. How can we make NASA happy? Right. Um, honestly, I will think like that. Um, if you're writing in from, um, I don't have a counter argument on that. I'm sorry. I don't have a counter argument on that. Okay. Just send me an email. And if you want to keep your name anonymous and you maybe, yeah, maybe yeah, does that help or do you have a better way? No, I would just make the point that uh, people being at these conferences at RDA, et cetera, are not necessarily representing their organizations. They may be here as individuals, and then that is going to be misleading. Anyway, uh, I, I don't have any problem with putting my oh, name okay. there, but I, I do think that we should be careful about these things. Uh, it's also a little bit of a GDPR issue, even though everyone has... Uh, 
I guess, tick the box that it's okay to share these things, etc. But uh, I think you'll get more answers if you allow people to be anonymous. Plus, people could just put Donald Trump there or something at the moment. Maggie, your point is well taken, and I appreciate the fact that you're you're being cautious. It's certainly, an X is fine, and we just leave it at that. That'll that'll tell me weight of distribution, and that's frankly the most important thing I need. If you don't want to include your affiliation, just put an X, and that's okay. I'm realizing that I don't have a really good argument for knowing your affiliation as I'm describing to you why I'm asking, and it seems stupid now that I've said it out loud. So yes, Maggie, axes will be fine. Uh, Shelly, we need to move on. Yo, yeah, <laughs> good idea. Okay, team. Um, so, and I, Christina, can you take over for me? Because apparently I cannot stop talking. Um, so Danny Kincaid is coming up next. This thing works. Okay, carry on. Great. Can you introduce yourself? I can introduce myself. Uh, my name is Danny Kincaid. I am a uh, manager of a geoscience digital data repository for oceanography. It's uh, funded out of the United States National Science Foundation. And um, I would like to talk to you about a challenge that I've been having that I've been socializing through RDA now for a few plenaries. So bear with me if you've seen this before because it's um, it's a little bit of a repeat um, trying to drum up some some kind of camaraderie in the room among repository uh, managers here. So this is an idea of coordinating um, data preservation with the scholarly publication. Um, that is the data that substantiate and um, form the foundation for all the scholarly knowledge that's getting published. Um, two different workflows, the publisher and the repository. And um, what I'm what I'm finding as a, a domain or a disciplinary repository is that domain curation takes time, and often the authors come to a publisher and um, they want to get the paper published. They want to get it in and reviewed um, as soon as possible. The publishers need access to the data um, immediately. This causes uh, some tension in the workflows. They're misaligned, and um, also there's not a lot of communication as a repository. Um, I don't I don't have a working relationship with publishers, so I don't know what the requirements and the needs are and and those timetables for the workflow. So this is trying to coordinate. Um, what happens for for my repository is um, this creates a lot of stress um, as authors come in at the very last minute and dump quite a large corpus of data on a disciplinary repository. So we have to do quality control and we have to aggregate metadata. We have to um, do a lot of metadata checks and quality um, quality checks on that, it all takes time. And so there's a lot of friction that happens, a lot of tense moments. Um, so I've socialized this, this idea or this problem started coming up primarily through COVID when um, for oceanography, there was no seagoing um, activity that happened. So everybody stayed home quarantined and started publishing and, um, and they were good at it. And data came flooding into my repository and we were hamstrung. And um, and it was a very difficult challenge. We were all transitioning, but it's stayed high. It's maintained this really challenging um, misaligned workflows for a long time. Um, with the help of AGU and Coptis, we socialized this. So I started working on this problem um, primarily by myself, even though other people felt it was a good idea and came up with uh, a set of recommendations and also a documentation of what a generalized di di disciplinary repository workflow looks like. And with the help of uh, Wiley 8 through AGU, what a publisher generic workflow looks like. And so we kind of started documenting these problems and socializing it to publishers through a workshop that Coptis and AGU supported. Um, made some really great progress um, at the last couple RDA plenaries. Um, and in Sweden this year, I actually got publishers to um, to say, oh yeah, that we should probably coordinate a little more. And that's many thanks to Taylor and Francis. That's Matt Cannon and uh, Rebecca Taylor Grant. And so I got one publisher, one publisher. Um, but all the while people saying, yeah, this matters. So um, it's been kind of a long journey primarily me, but I'm trying to stand up a working group. And um, here's kind of the nuts and bolts of this. I've drafted a, a case statement. I had a group meet. Some people actually jumped on this shell of a working group uh, RDA page like Shelly just showed. I have one for this effort. And, um, and I believe you can even go there 
to join. And I would love if you're a repository or better yet, if you're a publisher, it'd be great if you're interested in working on this problem. So we kind of had a, we had a first meeting of about four people and we generated a case statement and we started working on editing this case statement and we started um, adjusting it for submission to the secretariat. But I am just one person and I've been really struggling to keep this effort going. And so I'm looking for a co-chair. Um, we'd like to launch the, the, um, the working group. We have a lot of work done already. Um, we need publishers to the table to kind of refine this. Um, let's see, I think I even have a, a sort of set of objectives for this, for this case statement. It's really not rocket science stuff, right? Start, start a dialogue between repositories and publishers. Shared understanding would really go a long way. Um, we've already worked on creating a visual model, but it would be great if we could vet it against more, um, more, uh, publishers. And um, this, this group has also recognized that there was an ideal data publication workflow working group within RDA that was um, working on some of these sort of documentation of what an ideal working group, or excuse me, an ideal workflow for publishing data would look like. What I'm trying to tackle is that practical on the ground model of what actually happens between a publisher and a repository. Um, uh, another another objective is to educate stakeholders on these touch points. Like, where is it that the publisher needs the repository? The repository needs the publisher. Um, document a set of use cases in repositories that where this happens, and then create a set of recommendations. So the check marks just were are indicating things that are are in progress or well underway. Um, and that's pretty much it. Uh, I would love for you to join. Better yet, if this really interests you think about co-chairing and um, some, some links. You can take a look at the draft case statement there. Um, prior, I, you know, join, join the working group, please, please, please. Um, and that's it. Um, does anyone have any questions of Danny? Oh, I'm sorry. So the, the question was, which repository does Danny represent? The answer was Bicodema. Biology and chemistry in the water column. Bicodema, what's all? Any other questions? Kirsten, could you, could you go to the microphone? Danny, come to the microphone. Have you at all investigated uh, how domain specific the workflows are? Um, and I'm specifically saying that because we had a meeting with publishers and editors at our geochemistry conference last year and actually agreed on steps to take. So I, I wonder I, how generic things need to be versus, you know, the domains actually coming up with their procedures in a more specific That's a way. great, you mean within the domains, Kirsten? Yeah, within, you know, like, I mean, like let's say geochemistry to that, that, that. I would love to vet that. Seismology I mean, I, or, yeah, I think, I think it depends on the level of curation that causes the bottleneck. And, um, we have use cases within our repository, but I think that set of use cases that the group decided that that would be a good thing to, you know, to, to collect would elucid, it would, we kind of illuminate that, right? How generic or how specific does the workflow need to be for, for reaching out across the publication aisle to the publishers? Because I, I don't know if Biko Demo's um, workflow is close to one geo, you know, I mean, not um, uh, like, Pet DB or said yeah, or your, your work. It would it but, would be EarthCam and I also thinking about the astro materials data system that we're operating now because that has requirements from the funder from NASA to actually do an external peer review of the data. So there is an extra step in the whole process that is specific to I would, yeah. that environment. I would love That's, to get the use cases across repositories so we can kind of get to that question. But right now I don't know. 
I, I know that other repositories have said this is a problem, but we haven't gotten to that step yet. So it's a, it's a great point. Kirsten. Oh, I can't even sit. Thanks. <laughs> um, it's, I think it's a very good idea to, to keep this, um, cop this work ongoing because, um, it is at least one little piece of the jigsaw that brings our world of data curation, data management repositories to the researcher's mind. Mm -hmm. They don't care. They don't have time. They don't want to. But if a journal says, unless you publish your data, you don't get the click on the on the right. accepted. This is done. But then I think this, for me, this bringing more journals on board, not publishers, because they have all signed copies and the enabling fair data statement or a commitment statement. But then you have the, the little, I would say, kingdoms of editors yeah. of journals and what they decide is what is being done. There are a few exceptions. I think, um, and I, I talked to Shelley, what AGU is doing with really, now people come early, they say, oh, I have to, I will submit to an AGU, AGU journal and I have to have a, have a temporary link to the data because they ask for that's a really good development, but we need more, definitely more. And what Kerstin was mentioning with the geochemistry world, there are communities who are still further away than others. So yeah. I think, but yes, I would, I would make sure in any of these initiatives to do a, a jointly effort because several people here in the room and beyond have been involved in Coptis, have connections, have done it. I think we we should really put things together and not just start yet another initiative, which I don't totally think agree do. with you. Yeah. yeah. And I think that's something that, you know, maybe, uh, Kirsten, we need to see how much of this can, we can kind of promote and uh, through Coptis versus just, okay. Yeah. That sounds great. But I think what Kirsten is talking about is like the rec at the recommendation stage, which I didn't put on here, but you know, we've already started to generate some basic recommendations um, based on vetting this to this, the Council of Data Facilities in the U.S. and um, at ESIP where repositories show up. And and um, I pushed this idea through working groups there or through, um, what am I trying to say, like uh, breakout groups at those meetings and generated a, a set of recommendations for a repository, which are really not challenging. Uh, I mean, I don't know if they're challenging yet because I haven't shared them with enough repositories to get feedback, but it's basically, hey, provide anonymity to a reviewer and or provide a share link for for that reviewer. And that's that's really all they need on the reviewer side. But on the on the um, journal side, I think that um, you know the journals need to help the repositories find those um, help the authors find those domain repositories, even if it's just pointing them to resources that exist like re three data and then maybe um uh, uh give them a sense of timing right oh you've come with your manuscript well here's how this is going to play out and here's the general scope here's right where we need your doi for your data set but right now they don't have any clue and they're in a panic when they get to the repository and the repository doesn't have any idea of well what is your time horizon for that when do you need that published by because you just dumped a large corpus and we're a domain specific repository. We're going to take the time to do this really well. So there's a, there's a short list of, you know, it may not be the perfect scenario, but these recommendations, like you said, would be a little step into easing that, that friction and maybe getting everybody kind of on the same page of sharing early. Okay. I think we better finish <laughs> now. It's great discussion. <laughs> um, I was just wondering, can we move the slides along? I've got to get into trouble for making this session a death by PowerPoint session. No, well, okay, sure. But this is not PowerPoint anymore. This is discussion. Oh, yeah, but all right, here we go. We're supposed to have a Auto. discussion. It's block. all right. Auto, Auto Lango. Yes. Um, You're going to introduce Auto. Yes. Um, Kirsten, we'll, we'll talk more. Yeah. Okay. Great. Thanks, everybody. Good conversation. Um, so our next speaker is uh, Otto Lang from Utrecht. And uh, just hit the green button and we'll have your first slide up. Yeah, okay. Thank Great. you. Sure. Well, good afternoon. Um, I hope I have a few minutes left to uh, introduce you a bit to the GeoInquire project. I want to thank, uh, say thanks to Leslie for uh, providing this uh, opportunity. Uh, 
after the good discussion we had in Rome about uh, GeoInquire. GeoInquire is a project in the um, environmental sciences, geosciences, which is uh, well, mainly concerned with improving scientific impact and sustainability of already existing research infrastructures. And it's a very, it's a, it's a mouthful. It stands for Geosphere Infrastructures for Questions into Integrated Research. So this is how we got to GeoInquire. <laughs> Not the most, uh, uh, well, obvious uh, acronym, but still. Um, it is a project that brings together some uh, already existing uh, infrastructures uh, in an effort for cross-domain harmonization and services improvements. And it's uh, also based on, yeah, you could say a growing recognition that truly impactful research on the geosphere must employ transdisciplinary approaches and computational thinking and actually enabling impactful curiosity driven research is really at the heart of the geo inquiry project in that sense you could say it's a science project but on the other hand it's also truly a data project because this impactful research um, essentially relies on managing data in a truly fair manner because it's argued that the key to empowering European researchers in the geosciences is to dramatically improve the access to fair data and products coming from the highest quality geoscience research infrastructures. And this also comes with the demand to take care of training of a new generation of researchers who are really capable of fully exploiting the potential of these research infrastructures and the advanced data. So this is, in a nutshell, the overall goal of GeoInquire. But what about the methodology? Because uh, inspecting the European landscape of all these scattered research infrastructure, we need to acknowledge there's a large sense of heterogeneity. Uh, the infrastructures are widely distributed across Europe, Europe and operated by numerous institutions. So therefore, we designed a, a bottom-up process, a wide-reaching consultation process, exploited amongst the various components, involved the geo-research uh, infrastructure communities, and especially we have, uh, you can think of uh, EPOS for the solid earth science data, EMSO, the uh, marine domain, Excel, carbon dioxide, uh, dioxide storage, ARISE, atmosphere data, and cheese for supercomputing. And in, and in doing so, we really have reached across traditional disciplinary boundaries, which was on the onset from the start, and we formed a strongly interdisciplinary team. And uh, not to forget, GeoInquire truly built upon already existing initiatives and projects from the past. So again, this is a project about improving things we already have done thus far. Now, in a nutshell, what are the scientific ambitions of GeoInquire? It's about the consolidation and the enhancement of access to multidisciplinary interoperable data sets uh, to allow previously infeasible curiosity-driven research, uh, mainly interdisciplinary, enhanced access to new innovative uh, observ uh, observables and data, and, and data products, opening new research opportunities, uh, from single hazard to multi-risk, supporting cross-disciplinary integrated studies of extreme geohazards, game-changing research possibilities in geo-research management, and provision of innovative data management, and so on. These are all the scientific ambitions of EPOS. As I mentioned, it is a science-driven project, but we also have a strategic agenda. And this is where I think the relation, especially to the RDA groups, comes in play. Because, first of all, we need to ensure sustainability through solid integration into ERICs and already existing ERICs because uh, we think that currently ERICs are the most, uh, well, natural legal entities for the long-term uh, preservation of sustainability. Uh, we also believe that the enhancement of fairness, and I'll come back to that fake term in a moment, of all data and data products is necessary to make it possible. And last but not least, training of the next generation of geoscientists and other technical specialists within an equal, diverse and inclusive environment. So the strategic ambitions are actually, you could say, the implementation of what we have in mind within GeoInquire. 
Now, I will not go into all these details in these uh, few minutes, but what you see here, um, the vertical silos are the existing research infrastructures, and it's where the improvement of services and metadata mappings and vocabularies and so on needs to take place. But you also see these transversal work packages, which are uh, mostly concerned with the strategic aspects of fair data management, of impact assessment, of training, and so on. I will skip this picture because it's a different representation of the former one. But I'll now come to work package seven, which we're within GeoInquire, and this is the work package which I'm on behalf of Utrecht University Library leading. And it's uh, a work package concerned with fair data management, legal compliance, and impact assessment. And uh, we have three main objectives, which is objectifying levels of fairness. Everyone's talking about making your data fair, but no one really, of course, knows how to assess whether it is fair or not. How far should we go? And we know that there are interesting groups, the RDA fair maturity model, also uh, the fair implementation profiles. Uh, Leslie told me about this a few weeks ago and it was very, very promising, I think. I see you smiling. <laughs> And um, but we also, as the second objectives, we need something to do with it in the sense of a truly fair implementation in the existing installations and infrastructures within GeoInquire. And last but not least, we need KPIs for that, or say metrics or definitions of statistics to bridge the fitness for purpose of the services with the fair metrics. Uh, it's good to mention that this work package is also concerned with further strategies for impact assessment. And then we are talking about KPIs that go beyond the mere statistics for fair assessment in the sense that uh, for fairness, it's not so relevant to find out how many users an infrastructure has or how many data is downloaded from a, a specific installation. So there are multiple dimensions involved there. Now, uh, I think this is my, my last slide. That's, um, the tasks in, in this work package are, uh, first of all, come up with uh, a metrics framework for the GeoInquire installations, so the infrastructures involved in this project, uh, for assessing the levels of fairness. And in doing so, we also work with groups that have developed tools for that. Some of you may be familiar, for instance, with the Fuji tool, which seems to be promising to uh, assess uh, fairness of data sets and data services in a more uh, automated uh, manner. But it's not a Swiss army knife, so we have to move on there. What we also see is that the idealistic metrics framework that we uh, try to deliver something which is far away from the practice, uh, practice of uh, the everyday practice of data managers working at the data installations and even talking about fairness is something that doesn't always ring a bell you really have to be aware of that there is a gap and we we try to bridge it so coming up with such a framework also means we think about the idealistic framework but we also have to come up with a framework that actually can be worked with and this is also covered by the implementation of these fair metrics. Then we also have, as I mentioned, the impact assessment of research infrastructures. This is where topics like persistent identifiers, DUIs, uh, complex citations, and so on uh, comes at play. How are you going to, to trace the usage of your data? How can you trace usage of your data in connection with publications, with the vocabularies, whatever you have? So. Um, this is where we really try to avoid reinventing the wheel and we really rely on the external world. And that's what, why the fourth bullet is a very important topic. It's the harmonization with the external communities. And we see a harmonization both in the thematic context as well as the cross-disciplinary initiatives. So uh, um, when it comes to uh, the thematic uh, context, you can think of uh, the entry world and geo and so on. When you think of the cross-disciplinary uh, uh, approaches, RDA is important for us, EOC is important, uh, the uh, fair impact results. So 
we really need to keep track of what is going on in the world. And that's one of the central issues in this, uh, in this project. And finally, training and outreach when it comes to dealing with all the results that we have, bringing it into the long tail if possible, or at least at the data manager's level. And um, yeah, what we learned in the first year of this project that we already had to reschedule our plans when it comes to cycles of bringing information, trying to get it implemented. We need more iterative approaches and so on. So it's also uh, yeah, a learning project. Uh, doing fair uh, learning fairness by doing so to say and uh, that's it for me in the Geo Inquire project thank you yeah. I'm not sure whether Leslie allows us to have questions if there are any yes or, you can have a couple of questions also no problem we so we can't see the chat Leslie if you could um, help there us. are no questions in the chat I would have I'll yell out when there are any any questions in the room? Oh, come on. I saw a hand, right? Didn't I? I don't have my driving glasses on, so you're a little blurry. Wave harder. Wave harder. Okay. Um, Leslie, so so um maybe you have a question. There is a question. I knew it. <laughs> There's one. Um Christina, do you mind going to the microphone? Christina Valpenfelder from AGU. I have a quick question. It's it's so basic. I was embarrassed to ask it, but for your training and outreach plan, do you have any more specifics on how you plan to achieve that and like what kind of resources you're going to provide? Uh, that's a very good question because uh, we need to take care of the fact that training mustn't be the last thing that you fill in. And in these sorts of projects, it's uh, uh, sometimes the case, but we have a dedicated work package for that. And with, with this task, we connect to that work package, meaning um, there's one work package on everything that has to do with training for the installation, so on. So for instance, summer, summer schools on Mount Etna or uh, transnational access uh, 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 stuff with uh, uh, courses in fault. And what we try to do, at least the plan we have now, is to introduce these well, say fair data management like training material as a sort of site events for the other for the other summer schools, EGU, and so on. Because when we just come up with a well, a summer course for fair data management with all the material that is already there, I don't think we will get beyond free inspiring. Yeah. <laughs> so it's it's really yeah, uh, having it as a site of event is currently our best, the best shot we have. And we also try to make use of all the good stuff that's already available. So again, not reinventing the wheel here. Thank you, that's great. Um, it's awesome to see the plan to integrate it early on in science training. I think that's the right idea. Yeah, well. but that's why this, in, uh, I mentioned this, these three strategic objectives and the first, third one was really about training it's also something which is acknowledged by the by the european commission we we also experienced this within the, within uh, within the epos pro, uh, uh, infrastructure in which i'm involved myself we do not know the scientists of tomorrow and the only way to learn about it and to have this feedback loop with your target groups comes through these sort of initiatives so I also see this training as a sort of communication because we learn a lot from the summer schools we already had in EPOS. Thanks. Yeah. Okay. I think we'd better think, move on. No, I have one question, Leslie. You interrupt me the second time. <laughs> oh. No, I just want to, to mention that Geo Inquire is not within the long tail. They are, the communities who are involved are seismology, GNSS. So it's really highly standardized data already. So this is quite an amazing project to, to bring even there more standardization. Yes, our, our main target group indeed is the data manager at the installation, Kissens Road.
Thank you so much. That was really brilliant. So thank you. Um, so Shelley, oh. can we move on to our discussion a little bit late? But could I ask you to lead it? It's too hard to lead it from the other side of the world. Um, I'm, I'm happy to, but do you want to queue it up? Well, okay. So just... Um, there was a suggestion put forward at the last meeting that we actually focus on repositories. And there was even a suggestion that we um, start another catalog uh, on repositories, but I can't see the point in doing that because we've got um, the RE3 data where you can um, find the earth environmental science and earth science data sets. And so I guess what we're trying to say is that what's the general feeling in the room on the debate for domain versus generic repositories and also how much, uh, what can I say, emphasis people put on fair care and trust principles. So if you go to the next slide, please, Shelley. And... Um, so I've just put these topics up here if we'd like to start some discussion on it. And at point C, uh, Christina actually has some slides from um, some work she did with AGU cataloging where data sets that are cited in papers are actually coming from. And she's offered to present those if you'd like to hear them. So again, it's just getting over a feel for um, whether people feel this earth science, earth and environmental science group should be looking at um, the issue of repositories or whether that's more than adequately been handled elsewhere. So I guess over to you as to whether you want to hear Christina's presentation because it's quite I interesting and then some elements of discussion. Oh, You're oh, in really? charge, Shelley. Ooh, ooh. Guys, let's do stuff. Um, so I would really like you to hear Christina's presentation. I happen to know the punchline. Some of you who might have been at ESIP this summer um, have also heard it, but it's I think it's evolved a little bit since then. Um, and then I'd like to share on the other side a conversation that happened in the Funders Forum yesterday on the same topic. Um, Christina, are you ready? Magically, your slides are next. So Christina is the program manager at AGU for Open Science Leadership, and she and I work very closely together. So as Shelley said, some of you will have seen these slides uh, already. Apologies, I do have some new information, but uh, I got an email at 2 a.m. this morning saying, Christina, can you uh, set the stage for the domain repository conversation? So these slides do not contain that new data. Sorry. <laughs> no worries. <laughs> <laughs> So as Shelley said, I work for the AGU. I've been there about a year, so a lot of this work uh, predates me, and I'll try to give as good an introduction to it as I can. Um, AGU, AGU, as many of you know, um, publishes 23 journals. We have a lot of members across the earth space and environmental sciences. Um, we've been working in the open science and data and software space for a long time. Thanks, Shelley. And uh, one of the more recent initiatives uh, is a grant called Accelerating Open and Fair Data Practices. Um, this grant we've received from the NSF, and the grant was designed to help us with our efforts to incorporate data and software citation into AGU journals, as well as to link data sets that are published in AGU journals um, with NSF grants so that the NSF could see uh, whether or not where, where data that's federally funded by the NSF is going. The policy that we've put into place has been around for a while. Uh, we require authors to put their data and software into a community accepted and trusted repository. Uh, we prefer a DOI and we tell them that, uh, but we have to uh, accept things that don't have a DOI. Uh, we also ask them to include a data availability statement. This is the human readable component of the paper uh, where the reader can go and see more context about the data, where it's preserved, how it was collected, um, that kind of information. And we also ask authors to cite their data and software in the reference section. This is the machine readable portion. Um, so there is a link between the human readable section, the availability statement, and the machine readable section, the reference section um, that's enabling authors to actually get credit for their data and software if it has a DOI. 
Uh, we also run a helpline called datahealthagu.org for our editors, our staff, and our authors. Anyone can submit a question to the helpline asking what to do with their data. So we get a lot of questions. What do I do? I have a terabyte of data. I need to share it somewhere, as things like that. Uh, our data citation pilot, implementing those policies, basically ensuring that we can dedicate staff time to checking every single of our 8,000 odd papers uh, to make sure that authors are complying with those three policies. Uh, that started in uh, January 2022. Uh, by August of uh, 2023, all of our journals have been enrolled into the pilot. Uh, so by the end of 2024, we'll have a full year of data looking how this pilot, again, just dedicating staff time to our policies that already exist. Um, has worked. And the staff time when you spread it out over 8,000 papers is pretty considerable. Our staff go back to authors. If authors have um, made a mistake or an error in their data availability statement, the staff can recognize. If authors uh, should have had a data set but admitted it, we try to recognize that to um, send back to authors their paper and say, this is really important to us. Please put a data citation in. Since we implemented that pilot, we've seen um, a large increase in one of the proxies that we're using for looking at how authors are complying with our data citation policy. Um, this proxy is the percentage of in-text citations. So I asked, I told you before that authors um, are asked, we asked them to put um, a DOI for their data set in the availability statement, and we asked them to cite it in the reference section. Um, so this is uh, when authors cite uh, in the reference section, they have their citation in the availability statement. This is that link. Uh, so it's one of our proxies for how much of an increase we're seeing in authors who are citing their data and software. And we've seen uh, a large amount of progress since the pilot started. Uh, in fact, the latest numbers for 2023 uh, are above 60% of our AGU publications for that month included the data or software citation uh, via this proxy. There was a big dip at the end uh, because uh, the data set that I was using hadn't fully ingested all of the information there. So sorry about that, it's messy. Okay, uh, so using this data set, so again, using the information that we have available to us uh, in the data availability statement, that human readable portion, uh, we've made an assessment of where authors who are putting information about their data and software there are actually uploading their data and software. Um, from this data set, uh, we're seeing that authors are using generalist repositories like Zenodo and Figshare very heavily. Um, so again, uh, information is for 2022. We publish about 8,000 papers a year. Uh, so 2,000, over 2,000 DOIs uh, for Zenodo data or software are appearing in data availability statements in 2022. And we've seen that we've done this analysis going back to 2019, and we've seen that repository usage for generalist repositories go up since 2019. Um, and we've also, at the same time, seen an increase in the percentage of papers of a data DOI. Uh, oh, okay, so that was my last slide, it turns out. Um, so if you look at all the generalist repositories that appear in our top 15 repositories, they make up about 70, 75% of all the data and software DOIs that are shared in data availability statements. So it's a huge impact on the data and software that are being shared by authors. Now I want to talk about a second data set that I have that I don't have slides for yet. So as part of the Enabling data, Fair Data project, uh, we have worked with Chorus uh, to develop a link between AGU published, uh, data sets that are published in AGU papers and data sets that are associated with NSF grants. So Chorus has gone to um, Scholix, the data site into Crossref and looked for data DOIs and tried to link them to AGU publications as well as NSF grant IDs. Uh, since Chorus started the uh, project, They've seen the number of data sets associated with AGU papers, including NSF funded research, but also including other funded research, double since, 20, uh, since 2020, which is when the, the project started. Uh, so another confirmation that our pilot is really having an impact on how authors uh, share their data and software in AGU publications. Uh, Zenodo usage uh, in the Chorus dataset, which again is drawing from Scholix and Datacite and Crossref, has also doubled every year since 2019 uh, for AGU publications. And right now, I think it's our third most used repository, again, looking at those um, links. Um, so from Chorus's dataset, uh, we have about 27% in 2022 of our datasets in uh, generalist repositories. So these numbers don't match with what I just told you. And now I'm going to tell you what I think is the reason why. Um, some of you may have seen that Shelley published a paper recently in Scientific Data. Um, this is on data citation. Uh, it includes a number of publishers on the paper. And this is from a big project uh, that actually uh, Shelley and Chris Erdman and others worked on at AGU before my time. 
identifying uh, when we started this project why we were not seeing AGU data citations in the references section of our papers actually pass through to the cross-ref metadata for each paper. So the credit link for even data sets of a DOI was broken. That is now fixed as of, I think, uh, June of 2022, May of 2022, uh, but we have a lot of missing data citations in uh, the references section, the cross of metadata for AGU publications. Uh, the chorus data draws from that information. So the chorus data set is about half the size of the data DOI data set that we're able to identify from our, the text in our papers. However, they both agree on one thing. Uh, the usage of general repositories in AGU journals uh, seems to be going up as we have implemented these policies to require data and software citation in our journals. And uh, I believe that's the keynote that I was supposed to queue up for this discussion. So I'll leave it there. Uh, the problem that we found within our own journals was also rampant across all disciplines that used a particular third-party provider, which provides their services to most journals. So um, you all probably have the same issues in the journals you like. So, um, uh, you're going to want the link to that paper? So um, yes, questions. Uh, so Christina, why don't you come back up? So I'll, I'll add to what Christina said yesterday in the funders forum, I verbally talked about the percentages and I'm going to go back because I think those numbers are really exciting for you to see, um, frightening and exciting, uh, that, um, uh, I was, I was seeing these numbers verbally in the funders forum and, uh, trying to, trying to, um, was anybody there? Just want to make sure. Because if I don't say it exactly the same, <laughs> you're not going to go, but Shelly didn't say it like that yesterday. Um, so, so the challenge I'm seeing is we don't want any op primary observational data landing in a generalist repository. Does, does agreement? We, we'd rather that be in a discipline repository. Anybody? Anybody? No, policies Agreed. do not say to use one over the other. And so this is what we work at Kirsten. Kirsten, do you want to walk up to the... Uh, oh, you have your own microphone. I forgot. Um, so they, they don't say this. And when I was giving the numbers and we were talking about interoperability and reusability, keeping in mind that funders have their own take on all of this and their own understanding, I said, so I just want you to know data, the data you want to be fair and reusable isn't. So... So what they're willing to support, and I don't mean by money, I mean by their volunteers, right? Like their RDA members, what they're what they are interested in seeing done is an actual weighing in on what types of data sets make sense to go to generalist repositories versus discipline versus da 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 da. da. Not which repository, mind you, because we don't really want that, right? We want others to determine which but um, the types. So I think that's gonna take uh, different types of working groups within RDA to come together to determine this, but having the funders understanding the issue was like a massive win. That's how I felt yesterday. So, um, and thanks to Christina's numbers, because otherwise I wouldn't have had the point. So hopefully we'll see a working group come out. Uh, you have the microphone, go ahead. Yeah, uh, Kirsten Ilga again. Um, I would have a very quick answer why Zenodo is often used, and this is because it takes 10 minutes to get a data DOI. If journal editors and reviewers would take possibly 10 minutes of their time to look at the data and to see whether they understand the data based on what is provided on Zenodo or Figshare, and would make this as a criteria for proceeding with the data, with the publication of the paper, I guess more than 50% of the people would go to 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 more domain specific repositories and I'm I'm also speaking with the experiences from our system science data you're where a, we actually editor, do yeah. look at the data and there there's I think at least 50% of the papers because we actually ask and our reviewers have to take yes I have looked at the data yeah. and I think more than 50% say yes the data are great, but can you please change that and that this is not understandable? So we have to somehow collaborate together with them. Mm. Any thoughts? Leslie, how much time do we have questions? 11 minutes. Okay. So is, is this our last topic? Yes. Oh, Excellent. sorry. And just the wrap up, but okay. I mean, yeah, I guess what I'm asking. I mean, I like what you said, Shelley, that 
people are now agreeing, look, some stuff can go into generalist repositories, some can go into institutional, but for the longer term sustainability, we really need some of those, what do you call observational data sets, which can be big or small from sensors or satellites to be in uh, properly maintained uh, repositories where they're domain repositories where you have expertise in the curation and quality of the data sets. Agreed. Thank you. And and just uh, highlighting the fact that this was an idea that came up yesterday. We've not canvassed the working groups or the IGs to see the interest and participation that hasn't happened yet. And if you're in the funders forum, if you know a funder, tell them how important this is to you because I'm pretty much, I'm pretty sure that there's like just one hand in the room that went up and said they'd help. Um, but they really need to participate. This needs to be something they care about. So so um, go ahead, Danny. A couple of points of clarity um, question for you, Christina. So Zenodo, really high, but Zenodo takes both uh, data and software So we, through GitHub. So as a domain, as a d disciplinary repository, when they come and say, here's the software that I use to analyze my code, we send them to GitHub to dump it and then publish to Zenodo. So that's doubly long because it's data and software, right? Um, yeah, it is a lump. Uh, however, we have done a separate analysis. I don't have a slide on it about data versus software in our journals. And so I can tell you- Separate it out? Separate it out. Uh, and I can tell you uh, maybe 10 or 12% of these would end up being software. So the other piece of this is that when they come to the disciplinary repository, which is my problem exactly, and we say, we can't give you the DOI today, um, they say, okay, thank you. And they go to either Zenodo or Figshare. And that's where they get their DOI and then go to the publisher. So so the, the, your, your top little um, line graph, right? Your plot is because disciplinary repositories are hamstrung by the ease of generalist repositories. And until the funders say, uh-uh-uh. But also is the, are the, are the journals saying, we recommend you to do this, we will wait until you get the DOI to publish a paper? No. Right? Your working group needs to be stood up for that. And by the way, we're on AGs with you. And then my last question, then my last follow-on question was, how, how, you said you were doing NSF, um, and is the is the ROAR or the or FundRef IDs in the DOIs to be able to tie them back to, like, how are you, how are you distinguishing just NSF? Okay, um, let me add clarity there. Um, we have not done any specific AGU analysis of NSF using our data availability statements, and we don't ask for funder information there. So it's, However, all, it's all funded data that you're looking at. How, how, we're looking at all funded data. The Chorus data set, they have attempted to identify for each data set which funder it is. I haven't talked to them specifically about what links they used. I would assume it's a link in the data set and or the paper to a funder, um, perhaps text search. Um, but It's a paper and it's a metadata metadata field. Okay. Um, but uh, that information I told you from Chorus is all funders. We have not uh, been NSF specific there. Thank you. Um, I, I, okay, thanks. Um, so I work for NASA's Chief Science Data Office. I, I cannot speak for NASA. I'm just a contractor, but this is my understanding of NASA's perspective. NASA put out a new what they call science information policy about a year ago. It's very aggressive, very forward looking, basically says everything has to be as open as possible. And NASA makes a distinction between what they call mission data and what they call researcher provided data. There's not always a bright line, but you can sort of get the sense, you know, something from a spacecraft or a field campaign or an aircraft is mission data. Anything that comes from a funded researcher is, is researcher funded data. Mission data have homes. Um, researcher provided data don't necessarily have homes. There's NASA has 35 repositories, give or take. Um, and the repositories were like freaking out. Oh my gosh, we're gonna get all this researcher provided data. And we don't like taking uncurated data. Um, so we would want to curate it better, but we don't have the resources to do that. So they were so they're really conflicted. You know, it's like we want the data to come to us because we will take care of it and we can find our NASA data, but we don't have the resources to do that. So it's, I think, kind of what Danny's problem is. Um, and so the compromise, maybe sort of a third way that NASA is trying to figure out right now is they're allowing for generalist repositories. Um, and this, of course, you know, only works for the relatively small data. 
Um, but they're working a um, MOU with CERN so that they will have a special space within Zenodo that is NASA. Um, and it, it can impose a few more requirements like grant ID. But then the other cool thing is that the new release of Zenodo, you know, Zenodo already has communities. This would just be somewhat of a tailored community. But the new release of Zenodo allows the community managers to manage the metadata for those data submitted to the um, to that to that community collection. Can't change the the data, the files that are uploaded, but can change the metadata. So that allows the cur so that would allow NASA curators to go in and actually make some improvements to data with Zenodo. So I'm hoping that this might be kind of a compromise way that it makes it easy for the researcher, but gets a little bit more information and allows the curators to do something as research research so provides. Zenodo, so this is Zenodo, and it's metadata in Zenodo already published. So, so that one, that you should, the people online can't hear you. And Maggie, the new, Maggie the new has her hand up. She's next. Oh, I'm sorry. We can't see hands or chat. Sorry. Please let us know. I was just saying. Yeah. Can Daddy repeat that? But we've got to uh, just, Maggie just in. We've got four minutes left. To clarify, um, when you submit a, a contribution to a community, before it's accepted, you have to get the OK of the community manager. They don't add anything. They just check whether it fits into the community. So this is, yeah. And yeah. once you have it in one community and it's accepted, you can bring it to others. It's just a different workflow. You have to set up the community ahead of time. So, so sorry. NASA would set up, you know, yeah. NASA heliophysics community or something I, like that. And then you would have to be have permission to submit to that. Yeah. And, and then when you do submit to that, the community managers would have permissions to edit the embedding. So it's like a little sandbox before you actually publish it. It's not it, a sandbox, it's it, a carve so, out. So before we go too deep, I think it's a really cool idea and I think we should all understand it and, and Leslie, we should have Mark come discuss it. Um, Maggie, please go ahead. Yeah, thanks. Uh, I just wanted to make the comment that, uh, or actually two comments. First about uh, finding a disciplinary uh, repository. Uh, we I ran a, uh, together with a colleague here, uh, a research data management introductory course for PhD students. And one of the exercises we have is let them loose with uh, the RE3 uh, data.org uh, search interface to try to identify uh, possible uh, the repositories for their research and, and almost all of them completely fail because they don't understand how to use the interface or they use the interface and they don't even find repositories that they know are there in existence. So something right. needs to be done there. Uh, I'm not sure what group should be working with that and, and help them to, to sort that out. That, that's one thing. And, and my second, maybe more important point is that I, I think one issue with researchers publishing data when in connection with writing an article or, or a book or something like that, and then being asked by the publisher to, to provide their data is that they often uh, tend to only publish a subset of their total data set. Uh, because that's exactly those variables that went into the paper. And, and that's a big loss because and, uh, very often the complete data set never is published as a whole. And uh, therefore it uh, really uh, lowers the potential for other people to go in and, and build on the research that has been published. And, and that's something again, that needs to be discussed, I think with everyone involved in, in this whole ecosystem. Yeah, I, that did come up at the funders forum yesterday, and there, there wasn't there, the answer was the same that they support the paper, the data for the paper. So it, yeah, we we need to come back at that again. Um, we have one minute left. Leslie, would you like to do a wrap up? Well, um, go to my wrap up slide. Yes, ma'am. Uh, I guess we're going to keep keep going. Uh, who wants to present at the next plenary and who wants to be a chair? And then we have this decision as to whether the ESESIG group morphs into a community of practice. Um, and whether we do that, we still need people to present at the next plenary and we still need chairs. It, so it, um, look, thanks everyone for presenting. And um, Anybody have a project? 
Mark. Good. Thanks for your hand. Anybody else? Oh, Kirsten for one geochemistry, maybe or something. Okay. Kirsten Leonard, uh, Kirsten Elgar, Kirsten Elgar. I'm happy to speak as to where NASA go, gets with this. I mean, it's very nascent oh. right now, but I think, I think it's cool. we need many fewer presentations and much more discussion. Fewer presentations, more discussion. There, there's a format rec recommendation. Thank you, Mark. That's really helpful. Sorry, Mark. I tried to not have it go into that, but I agree with you. So okay. it sounds like we've got presentations for the next plenary. Yep, we've so we are you. going to have a session at the next plenary. Good. Thanks, and, everybody. Um, yeah. See you next time. Thanks, everyone, okay. for coming. Anybody want to be a chair of the community of practice, please just swing by here and hand me a piece of paper with your email. Great. Thanks. Thanks, everyone, for coming. Thank you, Leslie. Bye. Thanks, Maggie. Thanks for everybody else who was on the phone. Online.